Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And after this past synod, things are continually getting messier and messier in the Christian Reformed Church. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We are dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. We also want to continue to say thanks to everyone who sponsored us on Patreon. We're slowly making our way toward our goal of 20 sponsors at $5 a month. If you appreciate what we're doing and want to help us continue to put out content, head on over to patreon.com slash the messy reformation. You can also support us for free by sharing our content. I'm a terrible self-marketer and need your help. If you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this content, let them know about the Messy Reformation. Also, let them know about our newest announcement, the Hall of Tyrannus. We're really excited about this new opportunity to disciple reformers for the CRCNA. If you'd like more information on this, head on over to themessyreformation.com and look for the Hall of Tyrannus. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part one of our conversation with Mark Van Dyke. So Mark, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your family and the church that you're at? Well, first of all, thank you, Jason and Willie, for the great work you guys are doing with Messy Reformation. I'm a a faithful listener and appreciate the interview format here of of Messy Reformation. I'm really privileged to uh, uh, participate in the the, uh, podcast today. I my name is Mark Van Dyke, and I am pastor at Almond Valley Christian Reformed Church in Ripon, California. Um, I have a wife, Pam. Uh, we've been married since 2005, and we have four children who are now all school age. So they're ages 12 through 5, a daughter and three boys. And uh, they attend Ripon Christian School, and my wife works at Ripon Christian. And so that's a big part of our lives uh, Christian education has always been been kind of a big factor for us in in uh, in our spiritual formation personally growing up for both Pam and I and then and now for our kids too. Um, I born and raised in the Christian Reformed Church. Uh, all of my relatives were Christian Reformed pretty much growing up. Um, definitely all of my ancestors were Christian Reformed. And, and so um, I, I think one of the cool things about Messy Reformation is you guys talk with a lot of different pastors, some of whom have just recently come into the Christian Reformed Church or maybe in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, I, uh, I guess I would, uh, that, would, that wouldn't really describe me. I'm, I'm sort of uh, born and raised um, in the Christian Reformed Church. And, uh, you know, my, my grandparents were pretty much all born in the Chicago area. And so uh, Dutch in ethnicity and, and background, I would say, but not really Dutch in culture. I would say far more American in that regard. Um, and so, uh, yep, born and raised in the western suburbs of Chicago at a CRC church plant there. And so when somebody hears that I grew up in the CRC, they would probably imagine um, attending, you know, first CRC of Dutchtown, USA, you know, that's, that's a lot of people's experience in this Christian Reformed Church, but that's not how I was raised. I was raised in a church with about uh, 15 people when we joined it. And um, we met at a school for my whole life, basically, until I went away to college. And that church uh, grew and grew and grew. And uh, we were the only kids basically in it when it started. And by the time I went away to college, it was about 250 people and um, a real outreach church. It's called Christ Community Church of Plainfield, but they just actually changed their name to Plainfield CRC, Plainfield, Illinois. And so that was a big part of my upbringing in the Christian Reformed Church was was, uh, kind of on the outskirts in a lot of ways of the CRC. I attended Timothy Christian High School, where a lot of those um, 
historic Christian Reformed churches were sort of feeding into that school, but but I wasn't really a part of that as being a part of a church plant um, out further in the western suburbs. And and I thought that's how every church was, that every congregation was reaching out to neighbors and growing, you know, doubling in size um, every few years almost at a certain point, um, doing a lot of exciting things in the community. And uh, that really informs a lot of my ministry even now is c- keeping an eye towards the visitor, the seeker, um, the, the person who is on the fringe, um, you know, feeding the sheep and trying to be faithful to that but also uh, kind of doing what Tim Keller says a preacher should do where we preach to believers knowing that non-believers are listening. And so uh, that's a big part of of my ministry here at Almond Valley and uh, been a pastor for about 10 years, attended Calvin Theological Seminary before I became a pastor. And uh, yeah, if if I were to describe myself maybe in in a brief way theologically, I would say that I've had, I would say, two awakenings theologically during my ministry life. during seminary, I, I enjoyed my time for the most part at Calvin, but I have always struggled with assigned reading and assign, you know, assignments, tests, quizzes. I always feel like it's learning just for learning's sake. And so really it was out of seminary that I started to do a lot of learning on my own. And I found Martin Lloyd-Jones and his um, his preaching. I don't know how I stumbled on it, but I uh, it just really resonated with me that Reformed preaching could be so enthusiastic and passionate. Uh, so simple, so straightforward and clear, um, but also attractive to, in Martin Lloyd-Jones's case, London in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, where that revival happened at Westminster Chapel. And then even a little bit later, I'd say my other awakening has really come from digging into Herman Bovink a lot. Uh, again, as my time in seminary, I, I was probably assigned to read Herman Bovink. I don't know if I really recall reading a lot. But uh, just had a guy who was visiting our church who was all excited about him. And I thought, man, I, I need to dig into the reform dogmatics. And so I bought all um, four copies, four volumes, and couldn't put it down. And so that really informs a lot of my preaching and my ministry, uh, a word-centric ministry, um, the glory of Christ being central to um, sermons and ministry. And, and so I, I would hope that people could get a sense for what kind of pastor I might want to be um, with maybe that description of Martin Lloyd-Jones and Herman Bobbing being probably my biggest influences. Yeah, that's amazing. Have you had a chance to listen to, they have a bunch of Martin Lloyd-Jones's audio oh, yeah. sermons available. Have you been able to listen to those? So yeah, just this past Sunday, yesterday, um, I was teaching on Lord's Day 23 of the Heidelberg Catechism to my high school students. And I just played about seven or eight minutes of a Lloyd-Jones sermon for them during that. And, uh, you know, with a picture of Westminster Chapel packed to the gills with people in all mm-hmm. three tiers of it, listening to this great preaching. And so um, maybe for those who are listening who want to check it out, um, my favorite sermon I've ever heard is called The Healing of the Man at the Gate Beautiful by Martin Lloyd-Jones. And so um, look that up. He also has a tremendous sermon called um, Assurance and Sanctification, and um, yesterday's sermon that I, I showed to uh, or, or played for the students in my class was uh, Righteous in Christ. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I love it. You know, basically, whenever I'm in the car, I have a sermon on. And for a long, long time, that was Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yeah. Amen. And then I wanted to dive in a little bit more on Bovink, too. What was it about Bovink? Because uh, both Willie and I love Herman Bovink as well. Um, but for you, when you started picking up his dogmatics and reading it, what was it about the dogmatics that really gripped you? It is so doxological. Um, I, I um, Occasionally, I'll do uh, biographical sermons at our evening services at Almond Valley. And um, during Advent, I usually try to do biographical sermons where I'll introduce people to a, a hero of the faith, you know, that's been St. Monica and... Um, Mahalia Jackson and um, other people, of course, like the typical um, Abraham Kuyper and so forth. And and so a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about um, Charles Spurgeon. And so I love Bovink for the same reason I love Spurgeon is that there's a, a doxological component to Spurgeon's preaching, um, Bovink's writing, where there is no doubt this man loves the Lord. Um, he's not doing theology as 
sort of a yeoman's task. It's his job. He's a professor somewhere. And so I guess he better sell some books and come up with some ideas. (laughs) It is, um, it just flows out of the dogmatics that there's a glory of God that needs to be shared. Um, And so that resonated so deeply with me, even as he occasionally criticizes, you know, um, say Roman Catholicism or Anabaptist movements or, or Lutheranism, or certainly the, the liberal movement that was happening in, in the Netherlands in his day. Um, he still does so really with love for his opponents, I would say, um, but also with, with clarity and with honesty um, and using scripture, just constantly every page loaded with biblical references. Um, you know, I tell people, you could get excited reading the table of contents of the reform dogmatics is how, or you could get excited just looking at um, in volume four at the end of it, all of the scripture references that you're going to see um, from the four volumes. And uh, of course, reading it, reading the content itself is even better, but, but I think that really goes to show uh, he's, he's just so on the right track to me biblically. And it resonates with, um, the kind of pastor I want to be where um, maybe we'll get to this a little bit later where preaching is absolutely doxological. It's not just information. Um, it's meant to bring glory to God. Uh, that is the nature of reform theology is a high view of God, a high view of his grace, of his faithfulness, of his power. Um, and so I, that's on every page of the dogmatics and the wonderful works of God and the Christian family and, um, and all of Bovink's work. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I see that in Bovink and I even for my, for me personally, one of my first like awakenings, uh, theological awakenings was when I started reading Calvin's institutes and, yeah, uh, and I saw thing. the same exact thing in John Calvin, where um, I think I've probably said this on the podcast a number of times, but when I wanted to go read the institutes, I had people discourage me from reading it from my church because they're like, Oh, it's it's way too heavy and doctrinal. It's dry. It's not. And, uh, and I picked it up and I found the exact opposite. I just found my heart was on fire and I was falling in love with the Lord in a new and different way. And, and I remember thinking, Oh my goodness, why, you know, like this is, this is who we are as uh, Mm -hmm. like, this is just part of our reformed heritage that, that we see, you know, Calvin, I think it's, I got it from Calvin, but I say all the time, there's no way that you can know God more and not fall in love with him more. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, you can't like to dive in and understand more fully who God is and what he's done almost necessarily apart from your own sin is going mm-hmm. to cause you to fall deeper in love with him. And that's going to move your heart and change and change everything. And so, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. When when I preach, um, I, I want to preach in such a way as that God's word is central to that, but God's word is always revealing. I was just preaching on this yesterday. God's word's mm-hmm. always revealing who he is and what he's done. It's just showing us who God is over and over and over again. And that should stir our hearts toward worship every time we come to God's word. And And so I want to preach in that kind of a way where God's exalted to the point where people's uh, hearts are engaged with that as well. And I think we have that, we, we can see that in, in Calvin and we can definitely see that in Bovink as well. Yeah. It's what Martin Lloyd-Jones calls logic on fire. Right. And, right. um, you know, it's, um, I, I know that we'll, we'll probably get to this at, at other points too in the podcast here, but, but that is to me that the core of reformed preaching is an awe of God. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just preached yesterday on Malachi 1 and 2 because that's our Advent series. And the priests in, in Judah at the day had lost their awe of God. They were giving him uh, blemish sacrifices. Uh, it was a burden to them to go to the, the temple and do their job. And then uh, there's this great description of who the priest is called to be in Malachi 2 of, of somebody who lives in awe of God, who has sound instruction on his lips, who turns people from their iniquity, mm-hmm. who um, who just lives in the fear of the Lord, you know, in the most positive sense imaginable. And so uh, that's what I hear from Lloyd-Jones. And that's what I read in Bovink and, uh, you know, and and other great ministers like, like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon. And of course, Calvin, Um, those are so often the voices that really resonate with, with me and and the kind of minister that, that I want to grow more into. Yeah. 
Yeah, you reminded me of a quote. I think it's from Robert Murray McShane, where he said, you know, what God's people need most is a God besotted man. Um, mm-hmm. Not a high intellectual, but what they need before them as their pastor is a man who is just saturated and in love with God and seeking after him with his whole heart. That's what that's what churches need the most. Um, mm-hmm. Not the CEO, not the the organizer, but a man after God's own heart and who's saying and pointing people there over and over again. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So what, uh, what have been some of the, you know, we've talked a lot about preaching and stuff, but just what have been some of the joys you've had in, in ministry over the last year in your church? Well, there's a lot. Um, you know, I, my wife and I talk after Sunday morning or Sunday evening, uh, we have morning and evening services. And so we'll, we'll usually have a, a time to think back on the day and every Sunday we're just blessed, <clears throat> you know, walking out, of our church to the, through the parking lot towards the parsonage. I just feel a tremendous sense of, of blessing to, to pastor the church that I do where people are so encouraging. Um, you know, a lot of pastors, I guess, talk about how the church will let you know, you know, your issues and, and so forth. I, I feel like I just get such tremendous encouragement from the church that I'm at. And and I want to give praise to God for that. Um you know, I'll give maybe two little examples of things the Lord is doing that are independent of me, but just things that encourage me where um, we have a guy who, you know, just goes to the gym, just living a regular life. And there's, there's these people at his gym who said, he, that man has the joy of the Lord and I want to go to the church where he goes. Mm. And so they, they've they been attending our church um, for a few weeks. And, and there's another guy who, um, one of our deacons is just always singing hymns at work. He's a, he's a, um, uh, physical therapist. And, uh, so not a Christian work environment, but he's always whistling or singing hymns. And so again, somebody coming to our church now for the last few weeks, cause this man is, is the joy of the Lord. And, um, and that's attractional to people that he's living differently. He's living confidently and, and loving the people around him. And, um, you know, there, that's, there's a lot of that happening. I feel at our church and, and I, I'm sure that's happening in, in every healthy Christian reformed church as well, where uh, people are just living a simple, hardworking Christ exalting life. And um, yeah, so that's happening a lot. I maybe one personal excitement that I have is I, I did receive the Lilly grant for uh, my sabbatical this coming um, summer. And so that's a really exciting thing that my wife and family and I are looking forward to. My sabbatical will start in May and I'm going to, do a bike pilgrimage in England for that. So uh, cool. there's there's some cyclist who devised a way of connecting forty the 42 cathedral towns of England. And I'm not going to do all 42. I'm going to do the first four legs of that in Newcastle, Durham, York, um, and Ripon. And so uh, that'll be a really neat thing that I'm looking forward to this summer is uh, I'm going to do that with my dad and then my family's going to join me in, in Europe and we're going to spend some time, you know, going to Wartburg Castle where Martin Luther translated the New Testament into German and going to Heidelberg and going to Westminster Chapel where Martin Lloyd-Jones preached and um, it's kind of doing various forms of pilgrimage. That's the theme of my sabbatical. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. That's uh, that's really yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you know, I'm a cyclist as well. So I, I really, oh, cool. <laughs> I'll have to write that down for when I take my future sabbatical to try to do some kind of cyclist tour as well. Yeah, it's called the Cathedral Cycle Route. It's a it's a really cool thing that connects the different cathedral cities in England. That's awesome. I want to go back to something you said, because uh, on the one hand, I, I liked the way you said it. And uh, and on the other hand, it's something that I'm really passionate about, want to talk about a little bit more. You were you were talking about one of the joys has been seeing people in your church living uh, attractional lifestyles is kind of the wording that you used. And I thought, boy, that's, that's the kind of attractional ministry we want to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. You know, there's, there are some bad forms of attractional ministry, but, but when it's people just living out their faith faithfully in the world, um, there is something attractional to that. And I think, um, that that's been a passion of mine trying to kind of help walk people into understanding just living out our faith, just living out the faithful Christian life in the world in the midst of non-believers um, mm-hmm. has this 
leavening effect um, where we go in our workplaces and and in just in our communities. And so um, I, I want to dive into that a little bit more. Um, I, I'll tell a story too, because I just had this uh, really great opportunity to I'll break up one of my kids a little bit because it just kind of came out of nowhere. They weren't expecting it. We, um, so we're, we're pretty involved in hockey. So people kind of know that. And so we've been, uh, we spend a lot of time in a hockey rink and a lot of time with hockey families. And, and we're always trying to balance, um, the hockey community is like its own little world. Like they're just (laughs) hardcore, crazy people. And so we're like, everybody who's not a hockey person thinks we're crazy hockey people. And everybody in the hockey community thinks we're just not quite committed enough because we're always <laughs> trying to balance. And so they were, our kids were away at a tournament this weekend and uh, we're playing out of our kids played really well. They're putting up goals every game. Um, but we left on Saturday night so we could come back and go to church on Sunday and they had mm-hmm. to miss the championship game on mm-hmm. Sunday. And their, their coaches just couldn't understand that. And they're like, why would you guys? Why, I don't understand. Like, can I take you to a church here or whatever? And our kids had the opportunity to talk to their hockey coaches and say, actually, it's a really big deal for us to go to our home church and be a part of that. And the coach is like, well, what do you guys believe? And she said, well, we just believe, you know, everybody's a sinner, but Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And, and she just was preaching the gospel to her coach in just a nonchalant way um, because of faithful living. And the coach is like, this is really interesting. I want to talk to you more about this later. And I was just like, this is crazy. Um, and it was just because we were living that out in, in just a kind of a normal way. And then um, she had the opportunity to share the gospel really clearly with her coach. And so like, how do you, how do you else do you see that working out in, in your congregation or what, or maybe another way to say that is as a pastor, um, how are you encouraging your people to kind of, to live that out in, in their communities? Yeah, you're you're describing what what Peter says, and we shine like stars, you know, in in the darkness. Um, I think that that's contentment and it's joy. And um, one of my favorite books that I go to a lot is uh, the Puritan book, um, "The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment" by Jeremiah Burroughs. And so it's usually a few dollars on Amazon if, if people are listening and and want to check out just a phenomenal resource that encourages, again, the centrality of Christ in our lives and um, the joy, the real joy and the peace that we have of, of knowing we have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through him. And um, Burroughs talks a lot about how that's often shown in poverty. It's often shown in suffering. It's shown through sacrifice, the sacrifice of your family to uh to give up a good thing for a greater thing. So the good thing of hockey for the greater thing of corporate worship. Um, and, you know, that, that passion and that joy and that contentment is something that people want. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's sort of, um, it pulls people out of, um, maybe pulls people out of their, like, uh, their workaday life to notice someone who is different, who has a purpose. Um, and so, yeah, that I, I suppose that's what I de- generally encourage. I think it has to start with the target or, or start with the the core of our contentment, which is Christ and, and thriving on the word of God, you know, living not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from his mouth. And then from that, it's almost a natural thing. It's, it, I don't know it's, if it's something that you can manufacture or create to say, okay, go out and be attractional and be content for other people to notice that. It just comes from being filled with the spirit and, and displaying the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Well, I think, I think if you try to go out, I, I, there's this, there's this tension in being, I think being intentional. So I, I encourage mm-hmm. our congregation regularly to be intentional about putting yourself in places where you would shine or you would act like leaven. Um, but if you're in those situations trying to tell everybody, look at me, look at me, look how Christian yeah. I am, then you're being a Pharisee. And Jesus had nothing good to say about people who were t- telling everybody to look at them. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's kind there's, of a salesy element to that that I really don't like. This A salesy marketing kind of Christianity that, you know, with its catchphrases and so forth, that really that pushes me, it turns me off. And I, I would guess it would even more so maybe for the non-believer. But yeah, I think even more so anymore. 
because I think I think the world has gotten so used to some of that marketing y Christian y that it really turns people off and they don't want to have anything mm-hmm. or even even kind of a sales pitchy gospel presentation type of a thing. Um, I, th- I just don't think that that's it's not effective anymore. I I, I think I, I say this, people get angry, but like the four spiritual laws had a time and they were good and they were effective. But but anymore, I don't think it, it's it's effective mm-hmm. anymore. I don't most people you won't even get past you know the first couple and they've checked out and they've wandered off and so i think i think it's more effective and what i've just seen in my own uh, personal evangelism has just been like planting myself in a community and then just being a genuine christian and messing up in front of people right and and messing up like a christian where you ask for forgiveness and repent and um and then just taking opportunities to talk about jesus and point people to them and and people notice People notice when you go through big, um, I've said, you know, um, you know, most everybody who's been on this podcast or listens knows about all of the big health issues I had last year with COVID mm-hmm. and everything. And, you know, and having planted ourselves deeply in the hockey community, um, they watched our family and myself go through all of that trial and they saw our faith. I mean, I, I heard over and over and over again, how they were just looking in and watching us live. And they were saying, huh there's something different there that, that mm-hmm. we want to, we want to find out more about. And, and it wasn't us having to confront people with their sin and everything. It's just, they're, they start asking questions and the door opens up for more conversations. And I don't know. I just, I feel like, I feel like this kind of attractional lifestyle um, is going to be more and more important as, as our culture turns, right? I mean, we're just, we're seeing more and more, all of the statistics show that, that in the United States, right, Christianity is going to be is slowly being pushed more and more toward the margins. And so um, I think that's going to help Christians live a more attractional lifestyle, actually, mm. because we're going to mm. be, it's going to be such a stark contrast to be a Christian in the world that people are going to see very clearly the difference between a true Christian and, and just someone who's living in the culture. And so I think I've been thinking more and more like as a church, how can we make sure we're equipping our people to to live in this new reality where we are going to be light in darkness. It's going to be very clearly that that we're different. Yeah. I, um, I serve on the council of delegates right now for our classes. And um, at the most recent COD meeting, we, we talked a lot about uh, decline in the Christian reformed church and uh, tried to balance that also with, how could we describe churches that are thriving, that um, aren't just growing numerically, but seem really healthy spiritually? And um, there were a lot of good reasons given for both that, uh, you know, it's, it's it's not easy to to nail that down on either side, right? Why are churches struggling or why are other churches thriving? But the more I thought about that, even afterwards, I think it does have to do with joy. It has to do with um, if a church is a conservative and traditional church, but there is the joy of the Lord in that place. That is the strength of this church. And it is obvious for somebody who comes from a joyless home or a a difficult week and enters into a sanctuary with people who are singing and who are listening closely, Um, not just a a happiness, but a, a deep and serious joy. That's very intriguing to to people and and that could be the contemporary church as well um where um see i i don't think it matters as much contemporary worship style traditional worship style um the liturgy should be good quality of course but um but liturgical style to me matters a lot less than again doxology joy um giving real attention to the word of god trembling at his word living in the fear of the lord and awe of god I think that would probably describe probably almost every growing, thriving, spiritually healthy Christian Reformed church. Yeah, praise God. Yeah, I, uh, that would be my experience as well. As I look at all of the churches in our area that are that are thriving and growing, um, I would say that they have those same those same qualities about them, and I think people are longing for that. I think mm-hmm. I've said this for a long time, really. I mean, just as our culture slips away slips away, walks away, however you want it, runs away from God. Um, there people, I see a meaninglessness creeping over everyone. They're just realizing that there's nothing there. And, uh, and a lot of what they hope for 
is this kind of fluffy hope. It's there, that is no hope. It has no rooting. It has no grounding in it. And then they, um, and so all of a sudden something happens and they realize they have no hope and they have no meaning and they're looking for something. And uh, mm. we're, we're, we have that true hope and meaning um, that we can, that, that we can kind of root in them. And, uh, and so people, people look for it, but sometimes, sometimes it takes a crash right before they get to that point of, of really looking for it. Well, and on the other side of that too, I, I think you have a lot of struggling churches that are afraid, you know, they're afraid of trying a different thing or um, maybe pastors who are afraid to speak the word of God and people can pick up on, on that um, where there's fear in a community. That's the opposite of, of that, that joy filled spirit filled fruitful community. Um, and, and I see, I do see a lot of that in the Christian Reformed Church. Um, even at things like Council of Delegates meetings, there, there's a lot of anxiety in some of the comments that are shared. And I'm, I'm always just trying to uh, kind of evaluate myself sometimes and think, I want to be realistic sometimes about the issues that we have. And so you don't want to sound um, anxious about that and, and recognizing that there are issues in my own congregation. There's issues in my own life. There's issues in the Christian Reformed Church, and we want to address those issues. But but to do so with without fear, we do so trusting in Christ. He who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it, as you know, the last episode here with Lee Christoffels mentioned um, on your podcast. And so um, I think the Christian Reformed Church actually has a lot of learning to do concerning joy um, and concerning uh, letting go of fear. And uh, we're not going to return to the past. It's never going to be like it was in 1985 again. Um, but the Lord can do a new thing. And we can be faithful to the word, unapologetically preach the gospel, all of the word of God in its fullness and breadth. And uh, the Lord can use that. We can be confident. Yeah. yeah. No, amen, Mark. You were actually kind of answering the question that I hadn't even asked yet. (laughs) But uh, I'll take this opportunity to ask, because you're talking about these things. Uh, You've been in the CRC for for a long time, and you've been a faithful pastor. Uh, What are some things that you've learned about yourself and this denomination, you know, as your your tenure kind of, you know, stretches and elongates? Yeah, I um, like I said, it. I, I did not grow up in a typical Christian Reformed church, um, a church plant with a few families that grew and grew and, and was what we could really call more of a community church is, is maybe uh, uh, a, a decent way of putting it. And so I have had to learn a lot about the Christian Reformed church through my friends who would attend those more um, blue blood type churches in the CRC. Um, but also attending Calvin Seminary, which which was really good for that purpose of getting to know the the culture and the gaining some institutional knowledge of the CRC. Um, and then since then serving in, I served first in the Linden area, Linden, Washington. I was pastor of Sumas Christian Reformed Church for four years. That's just outside Linden, Washington. Oh, yeah. And now I've been here at Almond Valley and Ripon for seven years, almost to the day here. Um, and And so... I don't know. Maybe maybe I would be a little bit hesitant to to give any a broad uh, sort of far-reaching summaries of who the Christian Reformed Church is. I generally try to focus more on local ministry and what's happening in my own church in our own town, which has quite a few Christian Reformed churches in the area. But I would say overall, um, something that I have seen uh, in my own life and and just in interacting with other. Christian Reformed ministers and read, reading what they've wrote and the banner and so forth. I think um, there's a there's a real desire to to, to preach the word of God, um, but but oftentimes I've seen that that can fall short of its fullness. Um, uh, I, I think of something that John Calvin uh, wrote in his commentary on Titus where he said the preacher needs two voices. The preacher needs the voice. The shepherd needs two voices, one to comfort and gather the sheep and the other voice to warn and fend off the wolves. And so I think uh, it's really been my experience in the CRC where Christian reformed pastors are really encouraged in that first voice to comfort the sheep, 
you know, Jesus walked on water, you know, trust in him. Uh, Jesus healed the blind. He healed the sick. He rose from the dead. Trust in Jesus. Those are all true and, and very good things. But it's been a hesitancy in in a lot of the the writing that I've I've seen and the um, the sermons that I've heard to to use that second shepherd's voice. Um, maybe in some more traditional context, there's too much of that second shepherd's voice uh, where there's a lot of warding off of wolves and there's not enough comforting of sheep. Of course, that I would say that's one of the errors of somebody like John MacArthur who. Um, is very serious all the time. You know, can you imagine John MacArthur saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest, rest for your weary souls. You know, that's the voice of, of a good shepherd, a good minister. Um, and, and so a lot of theologically conservative churches might might be lacking in that, that first voice. But overall, um, I think in the Christian Reformed Church, there's been a hesitancy to, uh, to warn the wolves, um, to, uh, to call out error, um, like I said in Malachi 2, to turn people from iniquity. Um, that's the role of, of the priest in, in the Old Testament. It's the role of the minister. Like in, again, Titus, what Calvin is commenting on is the, the role of the elder to encourage those in the truth and to refute those who oppose it. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week for part two of our conversation with Mark Van Dyke. But until then... Don't forget this is Christ's church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season, and keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.